Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for the Neurology Video Journal Club. I'm Pushpa Narayana Swami. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist and uh, associate professor of neurology at the Harvard Medical School and vice chair for clinical operations in the Department of Neurology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. I'm joined today by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ryan Verity, who is uh, one of our fellows uh, at the Neuromuscular Fellowship at B Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Thank you, Ryan, for uh, joining me today. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, a paper that was published in the December issue, a uh, December 2023 issue of Neurology. The title of the paper is Incidence and Outcome of Neurologic Immune-Related Adverse Events Associated with Immune Checkpoint Inhibitors in Patients with Myeloma. The paper gives us some good, interesting insights into this topic. And as you all know, immune checkpoint inhibitors are more frequently than ever being used now as a class of cancer immunotherapies in the treatment of multitude, a multitude of types of cancers. The mechanism of action is by inhibition of uh, certain molecules uh, down regulatory molecules, uh, also called checkpoints, that are directed towards T cells. These molecules include the cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated antigen 4 or CTLA4 and programmed death uh, receptor 1 and its ligand PDL1. The inhibition of these down regulatory molecules results, therefore, in upregulation of cytotoxic T cell activity, and that in turn induces tumor lysis, tumor cell lysis. However, this whole aspect of upregulation of T cell mediated immune response can also have off target immune related adverse effects. And these can affect pretty much any organ system, including the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In this paper here, that comes to us from Italy, Israel, and from the Mayo Clinic in the United States in Rochester, addresses a few aspects uh, and gives us insights into some questions uh, regarding the use of these, uh, uh, these uh, compounds, immune checkpoint inhibitors, in patients with melanoma. The authors really wanted to look and see whether the frequency of immune-related adverse events was higher in older people they also wanted to sort of look and see what these, um, what these adverse events were and how they were treated. The other two questions address an aspect that is quite different and is very interesting. It's also something that we struggle with in clinical practice in, these, with, in the use of these agents. And the first one was, if a patient develops immune-related adverse events, and specifically here, they're talking about neurologic immune-related adverse events, to, although they touch upon uh, non-neurological uh, IRAs as well. But if a patient develops these immune-related adverse events, should we stop the immune checkpoint inhibitor or should we continue the checkpoint inhibitor? And the second related question is, if we do stop these uh, drugs, once the immune-related adverse event uh, has been treated and taken care of, can we then re-challenge these patients? And these two are incredibly important questions because as you know, many of these patients actually die of their cancers. And so the treatment of cancer is a very important uh, part of their management. Um, having said that, um, let me ask Dr. Verity again, Ryan, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Why don't you lead us through the study design and summarize the major results and outcomes of this study? Great. Well, thanks so much, Pushpa, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here having this discussion with you. So in terms of the study design, this is a retrospective cohort study with patients from the Ella Institute of uh, Immuno-Oncology and Melanoma in Tel Aviv, Israel. And as you mentioned, it was looking at the neurologic immune-related adverse events in patients with a diagnosis of malignant melanoma. Specifically, they were looking at patients who received immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy between January 2015 and April 2022 for just over a seven-year study period. Data that they collected was um, done so by review of their electronic medical records. They initially included all patients in their EMR over the age of 18 with a diagnosis of malignant melanoma who were treated with one of these specific immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so the ones they particularly looked at were ipilimumab, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, 
or patients who received a combination of the ipilimumab with nivolumab. So they started by reviewing the charts um, of patients who um, had received one of these immune checkpoint inhibitors for malignant melanoma. They initially looked to identify those who had experienced some form of immune-related adverse event. And those who they deemed to have experienced one of these toxicities had further data collected. And this data included demographic information, their age at treatment initiation, pertinent medical history, concurrent medication use. They documented the specific immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy or protocol that was undertaken. They also documented ECOG performance status scales at baseline, pre-treatment LDH levels, and then they used um, imaging markers to quantify disease progression throughout the trial. In the event of a symptom-based diagnosis, as in headache, dizziness, myalgias, those charts were specifically reviewed by authors with oncology and neurology um, areas of expertise who looked through the chart for other causes for these symptoms, and then their expertise decided whether to include or exclude these patients. As Pushba had mentioned, they really looked at um, a number of different outcomes, and one of the big ones being age-related frequency and severity of these immune-related adverse events. And for this, I just wanted to touch on how they stratified patients into different age groups. So patients were sorted into one of three groups based on their age at treatment initiation. And so group one was patients aged 18 to 60, group two was patients aged 60 to 70, and group, group three was patients aged 70 plus. So I know we talked a little bit about those age groups and we'll dive into it a little bit more, but is there anything else in terms of study design you wanted to, to touch on, Pushba? Nicely summarized, Ryan. Yeah, this is a retrospective uh, study uh, over a fairly long period. Uh, and I think I don't have anything else to add right now. So let's go on and hear what the results were from you. Okay, let's dive into the results. So for this, we'll pull up some of the figures from the article. Starting with figure one, this is the pharmacologic protocol that was deemed to be causative or presumably causative uh, and leading to the neurologic immune related adverse events in this patient cohort. And so really I wanted to, to bring the listeners attention to figure A, which breaks down the different immune checkpoint inhibitors that were deemed to be causative and leading to the patient's first neurologic immune related adverse event. I think the key takeaways from this figure are that 39% of the neurologic immune-related adverse events were attributed to a combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. 56% of the adverse events were attributed to a PD-1 inhibitor, either pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And the remaining 5% was attributed to ipilimumab monotherapy, which is a CTLA-4 inhibitor. Part B of this figure, which I'll just touch on briefly, is the presumed causative protocol leading to subsequent neurologic immune-related adverse events. And we'll move on to the next um, part of the results. I just wanted to provide some context in terms of the immune checkpoint inhibitor protocols. And, and I will say that uh, this breakdown is not unusual. Uh, we have to remember that both uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab are PD-1, whereas ipilimumab is a CTLA-4. Uh, inhibitor. And so, and the combination of a PD-1 and CTLA-4 inhibitor is especially known uh, to be associated with these adverse events. Thanks for offering that, uh, that other pushback. Okay, moving on to table one from the article, which offers information on the demographic and clinical characteristics of this cohort of patients. And so just to orient everyone to the cohort of patients that was being studied, they looked at a total of 937 patients throughout this just over seven year time window. Of this group, 689 patients were deemed to have had some form of immune related adverse event. And within those 689 patients, 76 were deemed to have had a neurologic immune related adverse event. So roughly 8% of the total cohort. We'll break down different parts of this table with a more zoomed in look to discuss some of the findings that they had in this study. So the first question that the authors had or first outcome they were looking at is the age related frequency and severity of these neurologic immune related adverse events. So just to orient everyone to the chart, we see the groups outlined along the top. And so to recall, group one is patients aged 18 to 60, group two is eight patients aged 60 to 70, and group three is patients over the age of 70. Of the 76 patients, 67 of them, 67 of them had one uh, neurologic immune-related adverse event, 
eight went on to have a second neurologic immune-related adverse event, and one patient was deemed to have had a third. Now, between these age-stratified groups, there was no difference in the frequency of neurologic immune-related adverse events. With regards to severity, which is highlighted by the CTCAE grade highlighted along the bottom of this chart, there was also no significant difference between the severity uh, amongst the groups here, with many of the neurologic immune-related adverse events being graded as moderate to severe, so a score of two to three, and 39% of the neurologic immune-related adverse events were actually three plus or quite severe. In addition, one of the things that we noticed about this patient uh, cohort looks specifically at the median number of comorbidities and the rates of autoimmunity in the past medical history of these patients. So interestingly, despite having age stratified groups, we see relatively similar numbers of medical comorbidities between the groups. Additionally, we see higher rates of autoimmunity in the older patient population, which sort of stuck out to us as a little bit interesting. And so I know that's something we were talking about when we were when we were going through the, the paper. But Pushpa, do you want to talk a little bit more about that or what your thoughts are on, on those findings? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Again, nicely summarized. Thank you. A uh, couple of things here. So in terms of the median number of comorbidities, we do see that there isn't much of a change. And uh, just to, uh, again, orient you, the p-values that you see here, uh, uh, we have, they do, uh, the authors did do a Bonferroni correction uh, for multiple outcomes, and the Bonferroni corrected p value for significance uh, should be less than 0 0.0016. Uh, so that's the Bonferroni corrected. So that's why, uh, you know, if you look at it, 0 0.005 is not actually significant uh, when it's Bonferroni corrected. Uh, you do see that the median number of comorbidities, for instance, in the uh, 70 plus uh, was three. The overall, if you look at the range, especially, I mean, they're they're up. They have have up to seven comorbidities, uh, six to seven comorbidities in each of these groups. So very equal. And one wonders whether that age stratification may have done that. It's all uh, you know. Uh, when you look at the first group, it's 18 all the way through 60. So we have some of those folks who may have. Uh, a tendency to comorbidity such as hypertension or whatever it is in that group as well. And then you have the 60 to 70 and then 70 plus, which are not too far from each other. For instance, uh, what, there may not be much difference between somebody who is, uh, for instance, 68 years old and 72 years old. And one wonders um, whether that sort of caused a dilution in uh, being able to pick up uh, a difference in age in uh, comorbidities by age. Also interesting to look at the autoimmunity. Uh, there were a total of 32 of which uh, 17 patients with autoimmunity were in the age uh, over 70. And that's a little counterintuitive for us because we tend to think of autoimmune diseases affecting uh, younger people more frequently or at least equally if uh, you sort of take uh, don't take time at diagnosis, but see overall. Uh, and one wonders again whether this may be sort of information bias from a retrospective database. We'll talk about some of the limitations, but uh, if it's possible that you don't ask patients about autoimmunity so much when they're younger, or, and you tend to ask people about diseases overall, you, you know, about anything underlying past medical history in an older population, perhaps that's why it is. Uh, hard to say, however. And as uh, Ryan said, the CTCA grade two to three uh, in uh, over a third of the patients, about 39%, I think, um, indicates that m at least these, this cohort, uh, about 40% of patients had moderate to severe uh, neurological related adverse events. Great, thank, thank you very much. I think the other thing that I found interesting when we were looking at this part of the table was the time from immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy to onset of these neurologic immune related adverse events. And so that's highlighted on the table just above the CTCAE grade. And what I think was interesting about that is when we look at some of these day ranges, in parentheses there, we see quite long and expanded um, time
timeframes for which patients were supposed to have developed these immune related adverse events. And so I think that's interesting, especially in the context of some of these symptom based diagnoses like headache and dizziness, where it can be really challenging to to pinpoint what's exactly driving the symptom that the patient's experiencing. We do wonder about at least in some of the patients, how the diagnoses were maybe arrived upon when when the immune related adverse events were deemed to have happened, you know, at the upper limit of 552 days. Yeah, I will say uh, here, though, just uh, looking at this table, th this is the time from the first ICI. Mm -hmm. But they do also provide the time to the onset of the immune related adverse event neurologic from the last course of the ICI. And so if you think of that in terms of temporal relationship, right. that median was about 14 days, two weeks, 14.5 days is what they said. And that range was anywhere from two days to, again, a little over a year, 385 days. So again, that's to your point as well. Same point. It's how does one, especially in some of the symptom related or any of them, it, they in their methodology, they actually tell us definitions of exacerbations, definition uh, of uh, a new in, uh, neurologic uh, immune-related adverse event, etc. They don't exactly tell us uh, how they define the temporal association. So I think that is a little bit uh, difficult to follow here. But your point is well taken. It's hard to say uh, how someone had an immune-related adverse effect, for instance, 385 days after their last immune checkpoint in a bit no i i think uh i think you make a good point there and thanks for clarifying that that time frame certainly as we learn more and, and expand uh, how we arrive at this immune related adverse event uh, diagnoses so i'm going to move on to the next next part of the table here and so with this part of the table we're looking at sort of the specific neurologic immune related adverse events that were most commonly seen within this patient cohort. And so we have the myositis uh, table highlighted because that was the most common neurologic immune related adverse event seen within this cohort of 76 patients. And that was diagnosed in 34, so 44.7% of the cohort. Now, the authors looked to see if statin exposure was associated with higher rates of myositis, which was not the case in this cohort. Interestingly, we know that in the literature, there's lots being published about the co-occurrence of myositis and myasthenia gravis in um, patients who have received immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And so six patients in this cohort were diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, but only one patient had that co-occurrence of myasthenia gravis and myositis formally diagnosed, which I think is an in interesting observation as well. In terms of the myositis frequency amongst age groups, the authors had commented that it appeared to be slightly more common as patients got older, uh, but we do see here we're dealing with relatively small numbers and we're not necessarily seeing a statistical signal in that direction. Other things that were commonly or other adverse events that were commonly seen within this cohort, so encephalitis and peripheral neuropathy were the second most common neurologic adverse events diagnosed in eight patients. Guillain-Barre syndrome was diagnosed in two. And really the remainder of the most frequent neurologic adverse events were these symptom-based diagnoses that we've talked about, which include headache, myalgia, and dizziness. So moving along here, We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other outcomes that the authors had uh, had discussed, starting with the treatment of these neurologic immune related adverse events. So we see that 36.5% of patients were hospitalized after their first neurologic immune related adverse event, which seems to correspond roughly with the degree of severity that we were talking about earlier. In addition to that, 35 of the 76 patients received steroids for treatment of their neurologic immune related adverse event. And so this was broken down into 22 patients receiving oral steroids and 13 patients who received an IV formulation. Beyond steroids, nine patients received further immune therapy. And the breakdown for that was one patient receiving methotrexate, three received IVIG, three were given plasma exchange, and two were given a combination of the IVIG and plasma exchange. The other thing we wanted to talk about on this slide uh, is the outcome of patients and the impact of these neurologic immune-related adverse events on survival. Uh, 
And so what we see with the bottom highlighted row, that 24 patients within this 76 patient cohort died during the study period. The most common cause of death in these patients was progression of the metastatic melanoma. And that was deemed to be the cause of death in 19 of the 24 patients. So 80% of the cohort. One patient was deemed to have died from neurologic toxicity, and that patient was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, which as we know can be very severe, uh, particularly in uh, the setting of an immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, trigger. In the remaining patients who died, the most frequent neurologic toxicities that were uh, encountered included myositis, which was the case in eight patients, encephalitis in five patients, and headaches in four. And so we'll move on to discuss some survival probability curves on the next slide, unless there's anything else you wanted to highlight here, Pushpa, before we, before we progress. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Thanks, Ryan. So uh, in terms of the treatments, uh, obviously we see uh, the standard treatments that we tend to use, uh, st uh, steroids, IV or oral, uh, IVIG plasma exchange combination. Uh, methotrexate, one patient with metho methotrexate caught my attention. I suspect that was probably added on to steroids, um, perhaps for myositis or something, uh, as a perhaps a steroid sparing agent, because as we know, methotrexate takes a while to act. So uh, it is difficult to uh, imagine it being used as monotherapy uh, in these patients. I don't think um, I saw clarification of that in the paper again. Hopefully I didn't miss no. something there. Uh, the other issue about uh, the, the patients who died is, again, the vast majority, this is what I mentioned when I first started, the vast majority of these patients who died actually died of their cancer. And so that's something to bear in mind. And again, as Ryan sort of uh, leads us into the next set of uh, discussion points, this is a perfect segue where we're, ta we're saying a few patients died, but most of them died of their cancers. So where is it that we go with treating their cancers with these immune checkpoint inhibitors when they do develop these side effects? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, for providing that uh, additional information. And so we'll move on to talk about these survival curves and the survival probability curves that the, that the authors published. And so what we're seeing here is um, a survival curve breaking patients down into one of three groups. So this is comparing patients who experienced a neurologic toxicity, uh, patients who experienced a non-neurologic immune-related toxicity, and patients who did not or were not documented to have experienced an immune-related toxicity. And so just to orient everyone to the, the table here, I believe the legend may be slightly mislabeled, but the yellow line represents patients who experienced a neurologic toxicity. And so if we look to the bottom of the image, we see that's our 76 patient cohort. The gray line represents patients who experienced um, a different type of immune related adverse event or toxicity. And the blue line is representing patients who did not experience immune related um, toxicity. And so what we're seeing here, I think the big takeaway from this survival curve is that the patients who experienced or were documented to have one of these neurologic immune related adverse events actually had higher rates of or higher chance of survival probability um, within this cohort. And so when we look at some of the hazard ratios that they calculated, the neurologic uh, immune related adverse event group had a hazard ratio of 0 0.497. Interestingly, the non-neurologic immune-related adverse event group also seemed to do better than patients who did not develop an immune-related adverse event, and that hazard ratio was calculated to be 0 0.741. And so we've talked a lot about what these immune-related adverse events may mean and their implications potentially on, on patient prognosis and survival. And so, you know, I think there's some discussion on whether patients who experience these immune-related adverse events are displaying the robustness of their immune system or the ability of their immune system to, to mount a meaningful response. I think the authors did a nice job highlighting some of the literature in melanoma surrounding patients who experience vitiligo as an immune-related um, adverse event with evidence that patients who develop vitiligo have longer rates or seem to have longer rates of progression-free survival. Um, with the sort of hypothesis that that's indicative of the immune system targeting the right areas and the immune system being appropriately active. So, Pushpa, anything else you wanted to touch on in terms of these survival curves? 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, if you look at it, it's clear that the separation is very clear. I mean, the yellow, is, which is the patients who have neurologic-related adverse events, you, you see the top line, and then the blue, which is um, the people who don't have any uh, adverse events, immune-related adverse events, are really uh, at the bottom, so they have the worst prognosis in terms of survival. Uh, and yes, I mean, you mentioned the adverse, um, the um, immunity, uh, because again, uh, most of these patients who die are patients who die of their cancer. And so if that robust immune response, uh, you know, does it mean that patients who develop uh, these neurologic related uh, immune adverse, uh, neurologic immune related adverse events, I should just say NIRAE, I think. <laughs> NIRAEs, uh, do they, uh, because of that robustness of that immune response, does the tumor then sort of uh, is, uh, tumor lysis occurs better and that therefore they survive longer. So it's sort of, uh, you, you're take, giving and taking a little bit, right? I mean, I think we're okay if we have neurologic related NRIN, <laughs> neurologic uh, immune related uh, adverse events that are mild. But then what about the most severe ones? I mean, it would be amazing if we could actually predict what kind of, uh, or control, what kind of immune related adverse events they would develop because obviously uh, uh, you know a little bit or more than a little bit of that immune response is a good thing but too much is not a good thing and mm -hmm. so we don't know where to stop and we don't know what drives that uh, you know medium good so a little bit is not good medium is sort of good and too much is good but not good <laughs> you know so exactly. what drives it really uh, so i think it's interesting but i think we do see this quite a bit in clinical practice. Yeah, I, I think you make some good points. We just need to find out how to perfectly control the immune system to that Goldilocks zone, and then, <laughs> right, and then, exactly. and then, then we'll be right. laughing. Absolutely. Just Absolutely. right. And you know, and this. So we published a paper recently, uh, two case reports. And again, this was this sort of dreaded triad of myasthenia, myositis, and my, um, myocarditis in one patient. And uh, the 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 point of the paper was not so much looking at the side effect because they had developed it, but the fact that. Uh, we used uh, some of the newer uh, drugs, uh, eculizumab uh, or uh, uh, ravulizumab, a complement C5 inhibitor, in order to control the myasthenia gravis in one patient who was actually admitted in the hospital, and we couldn't wean him off the ventilator despite all of these, the steroids, the, um, uh, the uh, plasma exchange, we couldn't wean him off, and uh, he did really well with eculizumab. And another patient where the, he had de novo myasthenia gravis and needed subsequently pembrolizumab uh, for an underlying malignancy that he then developed. Uh, and he went off almost 21 months and developed not a single uh, immune related adverse event, neurological or otherwise systemic. So, uh, and that sort of brings this whole question again into uh, so, if we damp down the immune response enough, uh, can we then? Uh, you know, be sort of in that Goldilocks zone, but how do we damp it down? So I think you know, uh, you'll talk to us a little bit more about retreatment now. So let's go there. Perfect. No, that's that's a great discussion. And so, like you said, now we're going to talk about two, I think, very clinically meaningful topics, which is what do we do or what was done in this cohort when patients experience these neurologic immune related adverse events? And then what did that mean for subsequent treatment? And so first starting off with, with treatment interruptions. And so what we saw in this cohort was that 52% of patients or 52% of the neurologic immune related adverse events, I should say, did not require a treatment interruption. So roughly half the time treatment could continue in spite of the adverse event. In 11 patients, there was temporary interruption. And the authors mentioned that temporary interruption had a median of roughly seven weeks. And there was permanent discontinuation after a neurologic immune-related adverse event in 24 patients, so 28% of the cohort. Now, moving on to retreatment, and I think this is a, a fascinating clinical question because, you know, as, as we've seen in clinic, we see some of the patients with a neurologic immune-related adverse event. And then when you're trying to treat the patient as a whole or look at the patient as a whole, you have to wonder what that may mean for their, their further malignancy treatment. And so within this 76-patient cohort, 
14 of the patients were then rechallenged with an immune checkpoint inhibitor after experiencing an initial neurologic immune related adverse event. So of those 14 rechallenges, 11 were from the same immune checkpoint inhibitor family. Now of these 14 patients, four patients experienced subsequent neurologic immune related adverse events. So roughly 28.5%. Of the 14, eight went on to experience some form uh, of a neuro non-neurologic immune-related adverse event. And within those eight, three also experienced a neurologic immune-related adverse event. So relatively high rates of further immune-related adverse events in rechallenged patients. The other thing that I found quite interesting about this retreatment group is that when we looked, or when the authors looked to see which patients were rechallenged, it didn't really seem like severity of initial neurologic immune-related adverse event was the only key metric. And this was highlighted by the fact that seven of these 14 patients who were rechallenged had received steroids for their initial neurologic immune-related adverse event, perhaps indicating higher rates of, of severity in those patients. And so, Pushpa, what's, what's your take on this, on, on retreatment and treatment interruptions? Yeah, uh, it's uh, really interesting, isn't it? Because this is so clinically relevant, as you've said. Um, and it would be nice to know uh, which of those uh, uh, neurologic IRAEs did not require treatment interruption. Were they the milder ones? Were Did they sort of decide? How was it decided? Again, that's the limitation of the retrospective database, right? I mean, you're not quite sure what was, you can't read minds, unfortunately, and you can't say why they decided in this patient to stop it. Did it correlate in some way with the severity? Were the, the, uh, were the uh, treatments more likely to be stopped in patients with more severe uh, disorders, such as the myositis group, for instance? You know, It's hard to say because this is obviously more than just the myositis number in terms of numbers. Um, and uh, how they decide uh, temporary interruption and then, but uh, the, this temporary interruption, again, I think those are the ones that you're talking about retreatment, uh, uh, but in terms of the temporary interruptions, they, uh, the duration of the interruption was also varied. When you look at it, uh, some of them, they interrupted them for 14 days, but the others, they interrupted them for over a year and then restarted immune checkpoint inhibitors. So you don't know what's going on with the neurologic related uh, immune uh, uh, neurologic immune-related adverse event or otherwise uh, other uh, immune-related ad adverse events during that time frame. So it's a little unclear. Uh, you also don't know, it would be nice to sort of correlate mortality because that's the main thing, right, of the patients who died of their cancers. How many of them did we actually discontinue these? How many of them were per temporarily interrupted? How many were permanently discontinued? How many were in that 52% group? It would give us some information, uh, valuable information, I think. And um, you're right, in terms of the retreatment again, uh, so here we're again between a rock and a hard place, right? I mean, you're worried about the neurologic uh, or non-neurologic immune-related adverse events you're worried about the cancer risk. So you really want to try and retreat these patients if that's all that will work for them. But then uh, the authors do mention that uh, they, in their opinion, it's relatively safe to retreat because most of these um, uh, recurrent um, uh, immune-related adverse events seem to be mild. But again, I think this is a big, big decision point and it really needs to take into account multiple things uh, including the patient's values the patient's preferences where they are going with this uh, because again it's hard to predict whether the next uh, uh, immune related adverse event is going to be mild or not mild uh, this is a fair number i mean if you take the whole um, uh, whole set of the 14 patients approximately 62 patients 62 percent of patients had uh, either a non neurologic or a non neurologic or both. So I think that uh, we have to sort of pause there and take that information and carefully use it in the clinical setting. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think, like you said, I, I liked when you said between a rock and a hard place, because truly it helps, it's how it feels sometimes, um, especially when we've seen some of the more significant or severe neurologic immune related adverse events and how devastating those can be. But on the other hand, uh, these are these are not benign uh, treatments that are or benign underlying conditions. And so I think that 
uh, therein lies the challenge. Yeah, I agree. Oh, cool. Okay, so now I'll turn it over you to you to talk a little bit about limitations and, and other big takeaways, and we can we can wrap up our discussion. Thank you, Ryan, and that was great that you really took us through the paper very thoughtfully, highlighted uh, all of the major points of the paper. So, excellent paper overall. Very important data. Uh, very important questions. Uh, the major limitation that the authors um, bring up is the fact that this is retrospective and it's uh, data obtained from an electronic health record, uh, a clinical electronic health record. So obviously, you know, one has uh, some of the limitations of a retrospective data set. So just overall, to look at this, you know, very high level manner uh, and go back to their questions. Number one, um, was the frequency or the severity of uh, immune uh, related adverse events, especially neurological immune related adverse events, greater in older patients than not? Uh, no, the, uh, we didn't find that, right? So they seem to be uh, about the same, but we also talked about that limitation there perhaps. Number one, the numbers were small. So, you know, we don't have confidence intervals there. So you wonder whether there's precision or not to be able to detect a difference. And number two, whether these sort of bins, these age groups overlapped a little bit and sort of precluded us from finding differences. So uh, that's a point number one in terms of the results that they were looking at. Uh, the second question, of course, was the frequency of the side effect of the immune related adverse events and the treatments, and you've summarized it there. Uh, I think overall the frequency uh, that they found in this cohort matches the frequency that we've seen described. These are not, um, you know, uh, very frequent uh, events, but when they do occur, obviously they can be quite devastating. Uh, it was interesting to me, as you mentioned earlier about the myositis and myasthenia gravis uh, combination and about one patient uh, only having that combination. And the, as the authors rightly point out, that can be very difficult to detect. I mean, myositis and myasthenia gravis can go hand in hand. And we used to believe, and I we used to teach that if they have ocular involvement, if they have ptosis and ophthalmoplegia, then they are likely to have uh, my, my, myasthenia gravis in addition to the myositis. But we now know that they can also have severe ocular myositis. And so oftentimes you need an MRI to look for signal changes in the muscles. Uh, and the presence of those signal changes will tell you that there's a component of myositis. It doesn't exclude a super added uh, myasthenia. But if there's nothing there uh, on the MRI and they have ophthalmoparesis, then you're uh, fairly confident. If they have the antibodies, of course, you're fairly confident. But uh, again, that can be a really diff difficult diagnosis. I was also interested when we look at the list, there's a list that we didn't put up here today of the uh, non-neurological um, uh, immune related adverse events. And that list does not have myocarditis. So we sort of talk about this triad and I, I sort of call it the deadly triad of myositis, uh, myocarditis, um, and myasthenia gravis, because that has a very high mortality, or up to 60% of patients with that can die. And they go seem to go hand in hand. Um, so we didn't see any. Of course, the numbers of myasthenia gravis were low. Again, you sort of uh, go back to this problem with the limitation of a retrospective record review. Uh, could there be you know, an information bias? We don't have that. You know, if, uh, the, the authors actually talk about it. They, you know, they talk about mortality in the series, and they say that the mortality here was slightly lower than some of the other series, and wonder whether uh, you know it, it had something to do with reporting in the other series, uh, whether only the serious side effects were reported in the other series, and therefore. Uh, you know, increase the mortality. It, there could also be, you know, the, the, uh, retrospective studies are, you know, sort of um, beset by problems of both underreporting and overreporting. So, could they could uh, there have been slight overreporting here in this study of some of these um, difficult to uh, decide or decipher symptom related adverse events, like you mentioned, especially those where the, the te temporal association seems to be a little bit looser than one would like. So I think uh, th that, again, a limitation of the retrospective uh, data set. In terms of the final two questions then, retreatment 
or t- treatment interruption uh, first and then retreatment after that treatment interruptions again uh, it's it's uh, heartening to see that in over half 52 percent of patients they didn't actually interrupt treatments in this large cohort of 900 something patients uh, but of course um, the the d- denominator for us is the 76 who had the neurologic um, uh, related immune uh, neurologic immune related adverse events of course so the denominator is 76 not the 937 but uh, so over 40 of them did not require interruption and that's that's very um, help, helpful again it would have been enlightening to know a breakdown of these patients uh, to see what the severity was and did that drive holding off uh, on uh, you know or did that drive continuing the uh, the drug, etc., uh, mm-hmm. and again, uh, as we already discussed, the retreatment. Again, very interesting information. Uh, there, it's not without problems, but still, it, this really adds to the data. There's very little data about retreatment out there. A couple of case reports. So this really does add uh, to that data here. Um, if you think about it, this is 14 is actually a large number of retreatment patients and. We saw what happened to them. Uh, it's re- reassuring that at least in this cohort, most side effects the authors felt were mild uh, and easily managed. Uh, but again, food for thought, I think, uh, as we go forward, it would be nice to have larger prospective studies, especially looking at these points in terms of retreatment. The other thing then then comes to mind is retreatments. You know, we've sort of looked at these treatments here. Is there a role for some of these other novel agents in specific syndromes? Maybe there's a role in other syndromes as well. I mean, the the pathophysiology of the immune-related adverse events is not clearly understood. It doesn't appear to be, you know, predominantly T cell mediated. There appears to be B cell mediation. There appears to be complement activation. Multiple things that are going on. So I think more insights into that pathophysiology, more insights uh, into prospectively collecting data on these immune-related uh, adverse events uh, would really give us more information. Uh, this was an excellent paper overall in terms of giving us uh, a huge amount of information. And I, like I said, I especially appreciated that the last two questions about treatment interruptions and um, retreatments. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, um, especially with your point about the large amount of information, like you said, um, there's just so much information and commentary that the authors provided about about these outcomes that they were looking at, which which I really think, uh, to your point, are, are very clinically meaningful questions. And they're things that we don't know the answer to uh, in a really challenging patient population. So I think it was it was really good to, to dive in and sort of dissect some of the the information that these authors were able to collect and write about. And so I had a great time going through it with you. And thanks for thanks for the discussion. Thank you for joining, uh, Ryan. I appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us for this Neurology Video Journal Cup today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion.